want to invite you to turn, please, to John chapter 11. Um, we are continuing on in our study of John, and it has been so good, just so good. Um, you know, last week we saw all the miracles and signs that Jesus had been doing just culminating in the great miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And how cool was it to look at that on Easter Sunday? Um, Pastor Billy did a great job just drawing out the point of that miracle that we might believe, that we might see the glory of God. But it was also that miracle, as we'll see this morning, that would be the final straw and would set into motion a plan to kill Jesus. So that's what the background is coming into the verses we're going to read this morning from John 11, starting in verse 45 to 57. It says, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went ahead to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priestess that year, high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. There, Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and he, there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he'll not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. So the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. So let's pray. God, I pray that you would help this word transform us, God, that we might be walking answers to the prayer of Jesus that many would see and believe and look to you and find life in you, Lord. So breathe life into our hearts this morning. Feed us with the bread of your word and uh, change us, we pray, as we look at this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have probably all had our share of situations um, that didn't quite turn out the way we intended. And it can be from like simple stuff to major stuff. So I remember many years ago when I was working in the hospital, um, a lady was coming, and I went to hold the door for the lady, trying to serve her, and she said, what are you doing holding the door for me? You think I can't open my own door just because I'm a woman? Get out the way. I can open my own door. I'm like, gosh, wow. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like trying to serve the lady, and she's offended by it. Um, and there, that's a simple, silly illustration of that, but there's many more, and you probably have your own share of stories of where you thought this certain thing you were doing was going to have this particular outcome, and it actually yielded the exact opposite outcome, <laughs> because sometimes even our, our best intentions can just turn out horrible, right? But sometimes, on the flip side of that, sometimes even the worst intentions, the most evil actions of others can seem to have the last word as well. Our lives and God's plan for our lives can often feel thwarted because of some bad experience that God allows us to go through. And it can leave us wondering, is God really in control? What, what is he doing in this? So let me just ask you, what seems to carry the most sway over your life? Do you find yourself shaped by a certain experience, maybe not in a good way? Do you find yourself uh, being, being just affected by something, maybe a conflict or a sorrow or a medical diagnosis or a tragedy or a natural disaster, your own fallenness, your own weakness even, or just some aspect of life in a fallen world. Isn't it true that these things at times can just seem like they dominate us, that they control us even? 
And in those times, God can feel distant. He can feel disconnected. And we may wonder why this certain situation or experience just seems to control us. I can think of many personal examples over my lifetime where I just felt dominated by a certain situation or experience. Sometimes just for a day, sometimes for many years. Even yesterday as I'm preparing a sermon, um, I, I found my thoughts just being dominated by a certain work situation. I'm trying to focus and Man, this, this situation with my, my work was just dominating my thinking, and I found it very hard to focus. And I had to call Danette and tell her, I, I'm just having trouble focusing. My, my mind is just being dominated by this thing. But it, it can be something short-lived like that or something long-term. I mean, at, at this point in my life, I'm only now realizing how certain experiences that I had as a teenager have shaped my thinking and motivations today, in some ways for good, but in other ways to my detriment. Do you have experiences or situations that can feel sovereign over you at times? Well, that's where this text can really reorient us to reality as God sees it. And so in this narrative, we certainly see people plotting and scheming to kill Jesus, but we also see remarkable ways that God is sovereignly in control of the details. And this reality can be hard for us to grasp at times, but I want to tell you, it can be life-changing if we embrace it as Scripture presents it to us, because these verses have all of that here. I mean, on, on one se- in one sense, these verses are just transitional in the book of John, um, but they're not just transitional. They address this intersection of man's evil scheming and God's divine purposes, How do you think of those two? Well, this text will show us this morning, here's the main point, that God uses the evil schemes of man to accomplish his divine purposes. Like I said, this is, this can be perspective changing for us. See, we'll all face things at some point that confuse us, that even tempt us to question God. We don't see the end from the beginning like he does. It would be nice if we do, but we don't. So we don't always have the answers to the whys of our lives. But what we can do, though, is look to Scripture and embrace God as he presents himself to us. And what we learn of God in this passage is how he uses these evil schemes of man to accomplish his will. And that's a complete paradox, right? I mean, it is. But... That's what we see in the text. So how does he do this? So point one, the glory of God demands a response. We see this in verses uh, 45 to 48. Jesus all along has been pressing this issue of belief in him as the divine Messiah. It's why he performed all of these signs he was doing. It's really the purpose of the book of John. Uh, Jesus promised in verse 40 that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. Now here in verse 45, we see that many of the Jews did actually believe. Now, this is a a bit surprising because he had just told the Jews that the reason you don't believe is because you're not my sheep and that he has other sheep of this Jewish fold that he will gather in. But here, John's actually pointing out that many of the Jews did believe. So praise God. They saw the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, and they did what Jesus prayed there in verse 42, that they may believe. Now, look at verse 46, but some... Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. That is to say, some did not believe. Instead, they went to the chief priests and Pharisees and told them what Jesus did. Knowing good and well that they're not going to be happy with what they hear, and they would want to do something about it. You know, just stop and realize what's happening here. The divine Son of God had just performed the greatest miracle anyone had ever seen. The glory of God was put on display in the most powerful way, and here they are ready to kill him. They Think about that. They, they saw this miracle. There is a man walking around who was once dead, and he, he's right there, but they just don't seem to be affected by it. I mean, same miracle, same Same Jesus, some believe, and some want to kill him. Why is that? God reveals himself, and there can be such opposite reactions to it. How do you respond 
to divine revelation. Well, what is divine revelation? Well, here, Jesus had just performed a miracle. He had proven himself to be the true son of God who holds the power over death and the power to forgive sin, the power to raise to life, and the one in whom everyone must believe. That's the divine revelation. We have divine revelation in the pages of Scripture, don't we? That is our revelation from God. We have the Bible. That's how God speaks to us now. And every time we read God's word, every time we sing God's word or we hear God's word preached faithfully, there is some response that is going to happen for all of us. There is some response. A response is not optional. It's a question of how do we respond. Neutrality is just not an option. How do we respond when God reveals himself to us in Scripture? While some certainly did respond by believing, others responded with this determination to kill him. What? How in the world does that happen? How do you see a miracle like Lazarus being raised from the dead, like seeing the sinless son of God prove right in front of you that he has the power over death, and yet you think the solution is to kill him? What? That's how powerfully deceptive sin is, though. And that should sober us. That's how deceptive unbelief can be. The people who witnessed the miracle, as well as this council, don't even seem to be affected by the fact that a dead man is now walking. I mean, what more proof do you need? But this is the folly and blindness of sin. Jesus had just overcome death. And now they're trying to kill Jesus because they think death can overcome Jesus? That is true blindness. It's what we read about in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What are they blinded by specifically in this passage in John 11? Well, look at verse 47. The chief priests and Pharisees gathered counsel and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. See, they, in this context, the Jewish people were being ruled by the Romans and the Romans were lenient. They let them do their synagogue thing and practice their religion and eat what they want and everything, as long as they just kind of laid low, they would be fine to the Romans. And so the Jewish leaders see Jesus as a threat. All of a sudden, this guy is being looked to and he's being followed and he's upsetting the religious establishment and he's really rocking the boat and he's gathering followers. Well, the Romans are going to catch wind of this and they're going to see the Jews now as a threat to their rule. And if they feel that way, they're going to wipe us out. Because after all, you know, in our context and where we travel in Nepal, it's like they're, they're India and China and we're Nepal. We're just caught in the middle of these massive superpowers and we don't stand a chance. So don't upset the, big, the people with the biggest guns. I mean, that, that's their mindset. So how do we do that? And Caiaphas proposes the solution is the only way to do that is to get rid of Jesus. So either the nation's going to get wiped out by the Romans because too many people are following after Jesus and they feel threatened, or Jesus is going to get wiped out by us and life is going to go back to normal. So here they are, blinded by their own political agendas, blinded by their own positions of power and authority and the need to preserve what they have. That's what the, the council is doing. But Boy, how much are we like that? How often are we blinded by our own sin? Blinded by our own political agendas? Blinded by our own indifference to the claims of Jesus? That we hear things and we give mental assent to them, but we're really in our hearts indifferent to what he's calling us to. How often are we blinded by our own positions of power and influence? A blindness that leads us to live and act and decide in a way that promotes self-preservation. That's what they were doing. But as we're going to see, Jesus does something about our blindness, doesn't he? 
We're not left to ourselves. In Pauline language, the next part after 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, you just go on to verse 6. It says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The very light that the God of this age once blinded, Jesus comes. He shines the light. He opens our eyes. He dispels the darkness. We see the beauty and glory of Jesus. This is the miracle that happens to every single believer. And it happens from outside ourselves. We don't open our own blind eyes. No, he opens our blind eyes. He says, let light shine out of darkness. That's what happens. Praise God for that miracle of regeneration. And as, at the same time that we're sobered by sin's power and deceptiveness to blind us, we should be encouraged by Jesus' power to open blind eyes. We don't have to be marked by the spiritual blindness that once categorized us. And so the challenge throughout these first 11 chapters of the book of John has been whether we will be marked by belief in Jesus or by unbelief. That's been the running theme. Will you ever be looking to Jesus in faith or will you be ever making excuses? The glory of God demands that sort of response. And we must come to terms with that. How will we respond? The glory of God demands a particular response. Point number two, the evil plans of man lead to the atonement. Now, this is an amazing section. Caiaphas, the high priest that year, sees the issues clearly. And for him, again, the only solution is Jesus must die. It's him or us is what he's saying. So they plot and they scheme to put Jesus in death. But let me to put Jesus to death. But let me ask you this question: Who really is in charge of putting Christ to death? That's really the question, isn't it? Look at verse fifty-one. John gives this commentary that says he did not say this of his own accord. That is a profound statement. He's not commending Caiaphas, by the way. Caiaphas thought that by killing Jesus, he'd be saving the nation from destruction by the Romans. But again, sin always deceives us. It makes a promise, and it temporarily seems to deliver. They did kill Jesus, but sin's promises don't ever ultimately deliver on what they say they would. Because, in our case, Jesus would rise from the dead. The church would grow stronger and even more powerful. The Romans would take notice, and eventually, guess what, Caiaphas, the nation does perish. In AD 70, when the Romans, in essence, wiped them out. So think about that. The very thing they were hoping to avoid by killing Jesus, they actually caused. From a human perspective, Caiaphas was making his own decisions. But from a divine perspective, God was accomplishing his purposes through the evil choices of this man. Great expositor and pastor Alexander McLaren from a century and a half ago said, the greatest crime ever done in the world is the greatest blessing ever given to the world. Man's sin works out the loftiest divine purpose. That's a mouthful right there. And then he gives this analogy. I love this. As the sea in its wild and impotent rage, seeking to overwhelm the land, only throws upon the beach a barrier that confines its waves and curbs their fury. So just let that sink in. Uh, just, just picture this expositor like preparing a sermon on the beach and thinking about God's sovereignty and the evil plans of man. He's just watching the waves crash against the shore and realizing every time they crash, the beach is getting higher because it's delivering more sand and it's, it's actually creating a wall. And the, it looks like the waves are going to just wash it out, but they're not. And that, that's how beaches are formed. Um, but just seeing like that's an illustration for how Man thinks he's going to overcome the lamb, the land, but actually God is curbing their fury. Amazing. Isn't this what we see throughout scripture, really? Genesis 50, verse 20, when Joseph says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. That's exactly what's happening here. Caiaphas means it for evil, but God means the same thing for good. They think the problem will be solved if they kill Jesus, just like Joseph's brothers thought the problem would be solved if they got rid of Joseph, right? 
But just like in the Genesis account, God had better plans for the same event. Notice I didn't say God had better plans that didn't work out, and so he had to figure out a way to use these events to get to the same end result. That's how we work. And when we think of God that way, we humanize God. We, we creature him rather than reserve the rightful place of creator that he deserves. God doesn't do that. The text doesn't tell us that. The Genesis passage doesn't say what you meant for evil, God turned for good. It says God meant it for good. He meant it. So when you wonder how God can be good in the midst of certain evils and tragedy and pain, including those caused by the choices of others, look no further than the cross as the demonstration of how God will use the greatest of all evil to bring about the greatest of all good, your salvation. Our salvation hangs on God's ability to look at the greatest evil act of mankind to produce the greatest good that we could ever experience. And it means this, as Pastor Billy communicated to me recently, the worst that evil can do is accomplish the purposes of God. Well, what are God's purposes? Remember that God has purposes both in salvation as well as in judgment. Okay, God has purposes in both. So no matter how evil the world gets, no matter how scary the headlines get, no matter how tragic the events of your life might feel, you can be confident that God is using all of these things to accomplish his divine purposes. We just saw it in these chapters. He will gather in the lost sheep. He, they will hear his voice. They will come. No one can snatch them out of his hand. And he will judge evil. No sin will go unpunished in the justice of God. He will ensure he will be glorified either in salvation or he will be glorified in judgment. The mercy of God will be put on display and be magnified or the justice of God will be put on display and he will be seen to be perfect and holy and righteous unparalleled to anything in all of creation. God will receive glory in both ways. These are the purposes that he is determined to accomplish. So if the greatest good can come out of the greatest evil, what does that mean about your situation? I mean, where is he calling you to believe? Just to, to trust him more maybe than you're presently doing to stop trusting in ourselves and our ability to control things and to control people and to control outcomes, but to, to trust him more than we presently are. I mean, isn't this the sort of upside-down faith that Jesus calls us to? Remember, Jesus said, he who tries to save his life, and we could say here, or his nation, will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Self-preservation Political agenda preservation. Jesus is saying, no, you, you don't seek to preserve yourself and the, the comforts of everything that you want and that you have. We, we lay those down when we come to Jesus. Jesus says, no, whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will find it. And so we, we want to think of our faith that way. How are we trying to preserve ourselves apart from Jesus? I'm not saying like, don't eat and drink and sleep or something like that. I mean, there's, there's basic <laughs> preservation of, of bodily needs and stuff like that. But, but I think what, what we're getting at here is this, this tendency to self-protect and to self-preserve and to think that I need to do this because Jesus certainly isn't going to do it for me. And I can protect myself and preserve myself and control the situation a lot better than he can. And so thank you, Jesus. I'll take the wheel now. Uh, kind of line says, whoever seeks to preserve his life is going to lose it. Whoever loses life for my sake and for the gospel will find it, will save it. So what are you seeking to preserve in your own life like these guys were doing? So it's not just that, that uh, God is in control of these things, but there's great hope in this passage too because there's, put it to you like this, this is a question in your notes, is it better that one man die instead of the nation? I thought that was a great way to title the sermon as well. It's better for you that one man should die. That's a memorable line. Love that. That's straight out of the text. So John tells Caiaphas, um, tells us that Caiaphas didn't say this of his own accord. Now look at the second half of verse 51. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Now, Caiaphas meant that Jesus would die as a martyr for the people. That's what he means by that. But of course... We know Jesus wasn't just a martyr. 
He didn't die for his cause like a suicide bomber does or like a military hero does who, who runs into a situation where he knows he's going to die just to save his platoon. That, that's not how Jesus dies for the nation. It's not like that. He dies for, on behalf of, instead of, in the place of the nation. See, there's this double meaning that John is pointing out for us. Caiaphas meant one thing, but he spoke better than even he knew. He, J- Jesus would die for the nation, not as a martyr, but as the sacrificial lamb. He died as the one who would take upon himself the sins of anyone who would put their faith in him. We sing in, in, in uh, uh, the old hymn, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. He died in our place in that sense taking upon the the wrath of God, the punishment for our sin upon himself. In my place, condemned he stood. When you think of the cross, do you think of Jesus standing in your place? You you know, maybe if this helps you, picture like your shoes there and Jesus is standing in them and there's a name on the wall behind him and it's your name, like that's your spot. Or like on a plane, this is your seat where you're supposed to sit and you walk up and Jesus is sitting there. He, he's standing in your place as your substitute, bearing the wrath of God upon himself so that you would not have to experience that. This is the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. He is atoning for sin. That means he's taken the punishment that our sins deserve upon himself and by so doing, bearing the wrath of God against sin. But he's doing so not as a sinner, but on behalf of sinners. He's doing so as a substitute. That hymn says, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a savior. This this theme is so central to the gospel. We see it all over the Old Testament, just themes of atonement. It's all over the sacrificial system and the animal sacrifices and the way the temple was built. and All of that history speaks of atonement. But we see it really unpacked in in the New Testament. I've got a whole bunch of scriptures there in your notes. We see it from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry right here in the Gospel of John when Jesus comes out to be baptized and John the Baptist looks at him and says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says, for our sake he made him to, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See the substitutionary language there. He takes our sin upon himself and he gives us his righteousness. Galatians 3, 13 to 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. See all the exchanges happening there, all the substitutions happening there. We deserve the curse, Jesus gets the curse. Jesus has the blessing of Abraham, the righteousness, the spirit, everything that we need, and we get that. We don't deserve that. There's substitutionary atonement happening there. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Again, substitutionary language. He's bearing our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Do you hear the language from John 11? It's better that one man should die for the nation. See that? The righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So yes, we can say Jesus would die for the nation, but not in the way Caiaphas thinks. And yet his death would save people from perishing, but again, not in the way Caiaphas thinks. And what's more, John points out, is that his death would not only be for the Jews. Look at verse 52. Not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Do you hear the echoes of what we read in chapter 10, verse 16, when he said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. We see it in Paul's letters in Ephesians 
1.13, for example, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, that contextually in Ephesians 1, that's Jew and Gentile, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. See the, the one people language that we read about here in verse 52? So this is what the death of Christ accomplishes, that, that he would gather the scattered children of God. We read John himself marveling at this truth Later in one of his letters, in 1 John 3, you see it there in your notes, when this beautiful section of John's letter, same author that's writing this gospel, he says, see what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And then it's like he pauses and goes, and so we are. We are children of God. That's amazing. The reason why the world doesn't know us is it didn't know him, but love it. Oh, we are children of God now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. Oh, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. This celebrating, worshipful reflection that John gives us much later in his life. We see the hints of it here. When he, in verse 52, when he's telling us that this prophecy was also predicting the, the day is coming when God's going to gather people to himself and they're going to be his children. Beautiful picture. Then John would go on to record the culmination of this great ingathering of the children of God, not just in the book of First John, but also in Revelation, right? This is really the destiny of all of history. Because it's the picture we see in Revelation 5, to have redeemed sinners, Jews and Gentiles from every nation, gathered around the throne, worshiping the Lamb who is slain. We see that in, in Revelation 5, 9. Again, how is this even possible? How can sinners enjoy the presence of a holy God? We should be annihilated. Because after all, in Adam, all die. But in Christ, all will be made alive. Christ comes and says, I am the resurrection and the life so why will you die? You know, we, we see that cry in, in the Old Testament when life is being extended to us. See, that's our, that's our hope. Is that your hope? What other thing might you be hoping in besides the righteousness of Jesus? See, to get saved, to become a true Christian, we must come to the complete end of ourselves and see our spiritual state as extended completely bankrupt before God. I bring nothing to the table. I have nothing good to offer. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Is that what the Lord may be showing you? You could turn to Jesus and confess that to him and he will have you. That's our hope. That's what this passage has been calling us to. Believe, trust, come to Jesus. So the glory of God demands a response. The evil plans of man lead to the atonement. You know, at the cross, God brings the greatest good out of the greatest evil. But he's not just sovereign in the big picture of the atonement. He's using the evil schemes of man to accomplish his divine purposes, which include God's timing over these events as well. And that's what we see in this third point. It's how this chapter closes. So point number three, the timing of God is not in the hands of man. So contextually here, we're told it's just before the Feast of Passover. That's an important setting to get in our heads for what's coming ahead. Lots of people are in town. They're getting ready for the Passover. They're having tailgating parties. The hotels are all booked. There's lots of vendors. And everybody's going, have you seen Jesus? Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen him. Do you think he's going to come? I mean, like, they, they want to arrest him. I know, bro. Like, maybe he's not coming. And, uh, and so there, there's these conversations going on. Everyone's wondering where he is. What's the significance of these verses? Well, it's, a, it's at least setting up chapter 12 and everything that's about to take place, but it's also this transition in the Gospel of John because we're moving from these first 11 chapters of signs and wonders of Jesus to the second half of the book, which is showing us the events surrounding the crucifixion. But we remember this thing in John chapter 2 when Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. And then there's this other time in John 7, verse 30, when they tried to arrest him, but they couldn't. And John tells us because his hour had not yet come. 
But what we're going to see later in chapter 13 is that Jesus knew that his hour had come. So the rising of Lazarus from the dead was definitely the tipping point. His hour had arrived. But as we'll see in the chapters ahead, he determines the timing of these events. He is laying down his life and taking it up again. No one's actually taking it from him, even though it may look that way on the surface. So Jesus, we see, no longer walking around openly, traveling to... He, he travels to Ephraim instead. He's not showing up at these uh, pre-Passover events of ceremonial cleansing and things that the people were doing to get ready for Passover. He's not there. And what's the point? Well, he's exercising control over the timing of his crucifixion and death. He decides when he's done. And, you know, this is a, a theme that we can relate to. It's like that, the main theme in the movie Cars 3. You remember where... Uh, Lightning McQueen, kind of throughout the movie, is like, I decide when I'm done. Nobody decides it for me. You know, and they're trying to push him to retirement. Or the Rocky series, you know, it just kind of repeats over and over. Um, or, or even in real life, you can look at the second greatest quarterback of all time, uh, Tom Brady, and just kind of the, the, the journey of, like, I'll, I'll decide when I retire. Um, you know, as humans, though, as mere, as mere mortals, we really don't have as much control over when we're done as we think, but not Jesus, okay? When, when Jesus said, I decide when I'm done, he has the divine sovereign prerogative to make that decision in a way that no human actually does. He is all powerful. He's all knowing. He's in control, and he decides when he's done. But it, it's not just that he's in control of the timing of his death. Um, the fact that all of this is happening at the time of Passover is significant as well. What is that all about? Well, we'll see more of this in the, unfold in the coming chapters, but Jesus presents himself as the ultimate Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world by laying down his life on behalf of the nation. So his absence from the feast, and, and everybody wondering, like, where is he? That his absence from the feast is almost a foreshadowing that the Passover lamb has arrived, and one day, folks, Spoiler alert, this feast will no longer be needed. We won't need it. Uh, commentator Bruce Milne said, as the pilgrims prepare to sacrifice the Passover lamb in commemoration of God's gracious liberation from slavery, so God's own true lamb is prepared and ready at the Father's summons to offer himself in the bloody sacrifice for the sins of the world. In that act, he will win a new and everlasting freedom for his people, amen, thereby fulfilling and rendering obsolete this and every Jewish feast to the end of time. Praise God. So we see God's sovereignty in the timing of all of this as well. Yes, man is scheming. Yes, man is plotting to kill Jesus. But look at verse 53. For that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Look at 57. Chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, they should let him know so that they might arrest him. But God is in control down to the very timing of when everything will take place. The timing of God is not in the hands of man. Now, that should be a comfort to our hearts. It really should. I mean, when we see that truth, how often are we discouraged because we don't understand God's timing in our lives? I mean, uh, I, I would say most of the time, I don't struggle with trusting God to be sovereign, but I would say oh, I struggle with trusting God's timing in his sovereignty. His timing doesn't seem like what it should be, which is really just a sideways way of saying I don't trust that he's really sovereign. Like he's sovereign over the ultimate destination, but not the path to get there. And, and he can't quite execute on whatever plan he's, like, surely he would have agreed with me and this would have happened five minutes ago, but it didn't. And so uh, it's taken 10 years or whatever. So uh, we, we don't, we, don't we struggle to trust God with his timing a lot of times? That's why we need a passage like this. Because it shows us that even when it comes to timing, God is not detached. He's not aloof. He's not impotent. The timing of God is not dependent on man's ability to execute or man's efforts to thwart his plan. No matter how much his timing may seem inopportune to us, these kinds of passages can build our faith to know that his timing does not depend on us. 
His purposes don't depend on the actions of man. Yes, he works through the actions of man. We saw that in point two. But he's not dependent on man to accomplish his work. So the the doctor's office that won't call you back, the refund you're waiting for, the prayer for a loved one that just seems to go unanswered, the positive pregnancy test that just never shows up, the medical issues that never go away, any other timing thing that we struggle with uh, uh, when we're looking at God's timeline, let this text assure us that the timing of God is not in the hands of man, that his ways are higher than ours that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. It's, it's more than just a, a Christian cliche, like, well, God's timing is always perfect. It is, but do you understand what that means? That's, that's what I'm pressing in and, and trying to get us to see here, that it's not just that it, it's gonna be perfect somehow, whenever, it's all gonna work out. It's not wishful thinking, Sometimes we can like take worldly, wishful thinking and just baptize it in Christian language and it sounds biblical, but it's, it's not a full understanding of how God works. We've got to understand he sees the end from the beginning. He's not just determining the end, but he's involved in ensuring that the, the path there, he's intimately involved with every step of the way, which means we can trust him in his timing for things. He's both sovereign and good. We can trust him, not just for an outcome that's good for us and glorifying to him, but even for the timing of that outcome as well. Because let's remember, if God can use the evil schemes of man to accomplish his divine purposes, he is most certainly using the seemingly human-driven delays to accomplish his purposes as well. So to wrap all this up, and Josh, you, can, you and Eric can come on up. Do you see, how do you see God postured when it comes to things like the unbelief of the human heart, the evil plans of man, the timing of his purposes? How is God postured with those things? Well, hopefully this text is showing us he's working through all of that to accomplish his divine purposes. And in this passage, the immediate context, that purpose was Christ's death on the cross and his purpose for our individual lives and our church corporately is not far removed from that ultimate purpose. It's not like, well, well, that's true about the cross, but in my situation, no, 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 no. Keep us near the cross, Jesus. Um, my, where, where does what God did for us on the cross in sending Jesus to die and raising him from life, how does that intersect with what I'm facing? It's not detached. May it, may it intersect with our actual lives. It means, for example, he can overcome the blindness and hardness of our own hearts when we look to him in faith. Where do you feel a, a blindness at times? Where do you feel like there's just a hardness in my heart that doesn't seem to go away? Oh, Jesus can overcome that. He can work through that. However weak we may feel, for example, in sharing the gospel with others, our hope really is that no evil and no amount of sin can overcome his purposes. There's no sinner that's so far gone from God that we say, well, we can't share the gospel with him. There's no way that person will get saved. What? Don't do that. God God can overcome the hardest of human hearts. You know how we know that? Because he overcame ours. (laughs) <laughs> what were you blinded by? Were you blinded by your own religiosity, your own good works, your own family upbringing, thinking that you can ride into heaven on the coattails of your parents? I mean, we, we grow up with all kinds of false, vain hopes that produce this callousness to Christianity. And when God saves us, he overcomes all of yes. that. Yes. There's no amount of hardness he cannot overcome. He can conquer both the hardness in our own hearts and he can conquer the unbelief of a dead heart and the resulting lack of faith that comes from it. So whatever we face in our families, whatever we face at work tomorrow, we can know and have confidence that he can use the seemingly sovereign sovereign obstacles in our lives to accomplish his divine purposes because that's what he was doing on the cross. Oh man, how much more so with the things we can't see or understand. So it's a call to faith, isn't it? It's a call to faith. It's a call to believe Jesus, to trust him a little more than we presently are. And he gives us lots of reasons in this passage to do so. So let's look to him. Let's look to the cross. Let's allow these things to remind us that, yes, we can trust him. He is good. He is accomplishing his divine purposes 
for his glory. And my heart can rest in that, can take comfort in that, can be propelled forward in sanctification because of that truth. Amen? Because if he can use the evil schemes of man to accomplish his divine purposes, there is no situation we face that we can't look to him and trust him confidently. Let's stand.